A survivor remembers, Barrick Latteris. Barrick Latteris worked with his father in the family lumber business after graduating from high school, buying firewood by the carload and selling it to bakeries and factories. He could have stayed behind as a laborer when the Germans liquidated the Lotz ghetto, but he chose to go with his family to Auschwitz. He is the only survivor. When we heard the Germans were coming, everybody ran out in the street. We saw them on their motorcycles with the dogs and everything. And it was kind of fun. An army comes in. Our parents said, ah, we know the Germans. They're not going to be the same like it was in our war. Really average people were not afraid. They didn't know what was going on in the world. They were occupied with work, with children, the occupation. But right away, the Germans burned the synagogue. Lotz had one of the most beautiful synagogues in the world, and they burned it to the ground. They took some Jewish people, women and men, and hanged them in the market by the feet with the head down to show us that we would have to be scared. The ghetto. They made a ghetto that strangled you around with barbed wire. You couldn't go out, but you were afraid to escape anyway. Where would you go? To the Germans? Everybody was working for the Germans in straw factories and shoe factories and clothing factories. I was delivering for the Germans straw, food, fabrics to clothing factories in trucks and by horse and buggy. For the work, you'd get stamps for groceries, maybe two or three pounds of potatoes a week for a whole family, one loaf of bread, some horse meat. You couldn't live on it and you couldn't starve on it. People who didn't work, you used to see them uh, swollen from not eating, and they just died on the sidewalks. In the ghetto, you knew everybody, so you knew friends who died. There used to be mass funerals. There was a curfew and rules so where you could not assemble. On every Jewish holiday, the Germans sent people to concentration camps. The first that went were educated people, doctors, lawyers. Then they went for older people who were not able to work. In 1940, the Germans threw the children out of the window onto trucks. I saw them do it. In Poland, people used to save gold and diamonds. That was their security. The Krepo, they knew which Jewish family had gold or diamonds. After my father died in 1942, I was three times in the Krepo. The one in charge used to be in the same business as my father, so he knew. I had to take everything my father had hidden and give it to him. Otherwise, they would have killed me. Deportation. The day they liquidated the ghetto, they told us to take whatever we can carry with us. And then we came to the boxcars, and they didn't let us take nothing. Chased us into the boxcars and closed the doors. We were riding with no food, no water, two or three days. One of the stations we stopped at, they opened the door for fresh air, and some of the Polish people tried to give us water. Nobody knew where people were sent. We thought they were shipped out to Germany or somewhere else in Poland for work. Nobody knew about Auschwitz or concentration camps or the ovens. Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, the first thing, they separated the women and men. You took off your clothes to take a shower, and when you walked out of the shower, they gave you a pair of wooden shoes and the uniform with the stripes, pants, and a short jacket. In the barracks, you were sleeping on a burlap sack with straw inside on a bunk until four or five o'clock in the morning. Then they woke you up so they could count you and select you for work. Our barracks was close to the crematorium and we could smell the smoke from the chimneys. In the morning, they were supposed to give you coffee, but the capo, he either liked you or he would just pour it on the floor and tell you to wipe it up. They gave you a piece of bread that's supposed to last you two or three days. If you ate it up, the other two days you starved for it. But when you didn't eat it, the next one stole it from you. I saw with my own eyes sons stealing food from their fathers. People don't realize what hunger means. In one camp, I was working in the kitchen, so I had enough to eat. But in the other camps, I was like anybody else. One time I stole a bread and they took me to shoot me. But a non-Jewish guy from Krakow, he was my friend, and he ran and took me away from the Germans. This non-Jew was on good terms with the SS. He used to smuggle them cigarettes, and we called him the Jewish father because he was sticking up for us at the time. 
To survive, you had to be lucky, keep yourself clean, and stay well. We had just one uniform, never washed, never cleaned, but you could wash with cold water sometimes. Some people were sick, hungry. They got so depressed they couldn't take care of themselves. People who got sick, you didn't see them anymore. I never got sick. To survive, you also had to always look like you were working, like you were digging or something. Some people couldn't work, and then you heard the guns, and you had to use your head. People who were smoking used to sell their soup for a cigarette. These people didn't survive. And some people who were religious used to go during the day in the corner to pray. When somebody from the SS caught them praying, they were, th they were through too. The transport. From Auschwitz, we were sent to Regensburg, locked in boxcars for days. There were people in the boxcars so hungry they couldn't control themselves. They would bite the flesh out of the dead people, eat the flesh of other people who were already dead. By Regensburg, we were worked on the railroad to clean up every morning from the Allied bombing. One day we saw planes coming. Our guards ran away and the bombs fell where they hid. They got killed and we were free. I ran with two friends and we were hiding in a cemetery. An old woman gave us food and clothes and told us go away. But civilian Germans surrounded us and took us back to camp. Later our camp was walking for weeks to another part of Germany. I was still with people from my my town, relatives, friends, people I grew up with. My three uncles, they were very strong guys, but they got sick and couldn't walk anymore. They shot all three. Everybody was waiting for their turn. I really didn't think about surviving. I thought more that I was going to be dead. We were walking through this little town, Laufen, in May 1945, when some farmers came running out on the highway saying, the war is over. Liberation. There was an army camp not far from there, and it became a DP camp. Then later we moved into a house, four of us guys. We opened a Jewish center, and I was president. Highest helped us, and UNRRA, United Nations Relief, and Rehabilitation Agency. People started leaving to look for relatives. I knew my own family went to the crematorium, but I looked for aunts and uncles, a relation. I couldn't find anybody. One of the guys I lived with, a sister, came looking for him, and we got married in 1947. In 1948, our daughter was born. My brother-in-law and I opened a fabric store. Buy it from the factory and sell. From one town to another in Germany and Austria, my wife had a sister who came to the United States, so that's why we came. Looking back, I was really bitter about the Germans after the war, but you change. You have good people, you have bad people, that doesn't do any good. Believe in God now. When my children were growing up, there were nights I couldn't sleep. I was still in Auschwitz and could still see everything. It was my heartbreaking and I used to cry. I really couldn't talk to my children about it, but my children and my grandchildren, they said to me, why don't you tell me? Now I feel it should be talked about. The picture here is a scale model of victims on their way to the gas chambers at, chambers at Auschwitz, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C.